Good afternoon and good evening to and welcome to the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs Daily War Room update. We are on day number 121 of the war with Gaza. It started with a massacre on the 7th of October and has been raging on ever since. On the ground, IDF forces are continuing to make progress, spreading out into all of the areas of the southern area of the Gaza Strip, Hanunus dominating, really discovering their dozens and dozens and dozens of tunnels and entrances to tunnels and killing many of the terrorists, taking others uh, um, under arrest. Um, what we're seeing also in the northern Gaza Strip is the expanding of the Israeli, the Israeli control in areas where Israel did previously pull out. The Hamas returned, operatives returned to those areas and again started firing rockets. And that has brought on this renewed uh, wave of really control in the Gaza Strip. In the southern area with the Houthis, we're still seeing a lot of activity. Both the Houthis attacking, firing uh, uh, missiles over the weekend that were shot down by Israel's David Sling and with a substantial um, American and UK response to that aggression, also expanding out to attacks over the weekend and earlier today on Iranian and pro-Iranian militias all the way through Syria and in Iraq itself. Um, this is really a quite a substantial attack. It isn't just a revenge attack, but really a wide-scale US-led with, with the su British support on Iranian assets. In Israel's north, Hezbollah is continuing on with that war. I can't stress this enough. We are at war in the north. Just no one is really talking about it and no one is hearing about it. Over 2,000 rockets have been fired from the north and anti-tank missiles have been fired from Hezbollah into Israel over the last four months. This is something which is constantly developing slowly, slowly, but inevitably almost um, into a full on blown war. That's something which we will have to keep on watching. In Judea and Samaria, the IDF forces are continuing to fight the Hamas and other terrorists as well. Over 3,000 terrorists have been arrested in the last four months and over 50 million shekel worth of terrorist funding, over 12 and a half million dollars of terrorist funding, and as well as hundreds and hundreds of weapons have been seized by the IDF forces. Over 200 terrorists have been killed there as well. In Israel, the really the tense calm has been maintained. We haven't seen any um, a tremendous involvement of Israeli Arabs in the fighting. The opposite really is true. We had that fear after the May 2021 incidents where Israeli Arabs joined Hamas to undermine Israel's security. But this time that didn't happen, um, thankfully, possibly because many Israeli Arabs were themselves the victims of that October 7 massacre, whether those who were killed as part of the rocket barrages that Hamas fired or those killed actually in the massacre itself. Some of them security guards, some of them really risking their lives to save Jews um, over and over again, going back into that firing range. Um, and so that's where we're standing now today. We're seeing in the international arena, overwhelming calls now for some type of political solution to be found. This word, These words, the two state solution are being thrown around. No one really knows what it means. Who would be the Palestinian state? Where would it be? What territory would it control? Would it be controlled by the by Mahmoud Abbas and the Fatah terrorists who have an institutional entrenched in law program to pay rewards, cash rewards to people who murder Jews? Or would it be Hamas who led the, the, the October 7 massacre? Who would be on that other side and what would it look like? Um, today we're joined by our special guest, Dr. Daniel Pipes, the president of the Middle East Forum. Um, Dr. Pipes has really been expressing a very clear view for very many, many years now. Um, and at least since I've been out of the army, I've been listening to, the, to those discussions, to those talks. And really, the idea is very simple. You can only make peace with an enemy who is defeated. You cannot make peace with someone who still sees themselves as your equal and as someone who can still live to fight the next day. I think that's the general idea. If I didn't too much destroy your idea, Dr. Pipes. Well, that's a perfect summation. Uh, I will not be arguing 
for that point right now, but I will be arguing that after Israel seizes Gaza, systematically destroys Hamas, the question is, what next? What is the day after? And this is a topic I've been focused on. Now, there are many options that are being brooded. For example, the U.S. government reportedly wants Egypt to manage security in the Gaza Strip, but uh, President Sisi of Egypt rejects this proposal. The Qatari government has said the Palestinians should decide this matter. Natan Sharansky hopes that the Saudis and Emiratis will help build an independent economy in Gaza. Nearly 40% of Israelis want Jewish settlement, resettlement of the territory. One analyst suggests turning Gaza into an emirate of the UAE. Another, even more exotically, suggests looking at the ties between France and Monaco to serve as a model. Now, while there are many suggestions being brooded, there's also pessimism that pervades. Not surprisingly for anti-Zionism, has deep and long-standing roots in Gaza. Khalil Shikaki of the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research believes that Israel will find essentially no one willing to step in and replace the Israeli army. And so the Israelis will have no choice but to run Gaza. The Economist newspaper predicts that Gaza will become another of the Middle East failed states. Former head of Israel's National Security Council, Mayor Ben Shabbat, expects that Hamas will clearly continue to be the dominant power and Israel can do nothing about it. In contrast, I am optimistic, which is not a good career move for Middle East specialists, but I will be optimistic. I believe in the possibility of a decent Gaza run by decent Gazans under Israeli auspices to everyone's benefit. My hope rides on the fact that Gazans have endured something monstrous and possibly unique in human history over the past 15 years exploitation by their rulers as cannon fodder for public relations. Aware that there's a lot of skepticism of this idea, including among my friends, I'll talk a bit longer than as usual on this, pro on this program to provide some proofs. By the way, this builds on an article I published on October 17th in the Wall Street Journal, if you could put it on the screen briefly, uh, where I argued for this um, concept of a decent Gaza. Uh, at that point, October 17th, just 10 days after the massacre. There wasn't that much information. So this is a bit short and not that substantial. I've been working on this topic now for, for three, four months and have much more to say. I will give you uh, a brief version of the argument, the proofs and the argument. There's six parts and a conclusion. First part is Hamas versus the Gazans. Now, I mentioned that monstrous and possibly unique experience. This provides the premise for anti-Hamas sentiments. Throughout history, dictators have used people as cannon fodder to fight wars. Most recently, we saw this in Bakhmut. Uh, Vladimir Putin used prisoners recruited by Wagner. That's commonplace. What is uncommon and perhaps unique is that Hamas, since 2007, has implemented a policy of purposely tormenting its subject population. Rather than sacrifice soldiers for battlefield gains, it sacrificed civilians for public relations purposes. In other words, Hamas repeatedly attacks Israel to provoke retaliation, correctly expecting that bombs, destruction, and death will bring support from anti-Semites of all persuasions including Palestinian nationalists, the Iranian and Turkish governments, Muslim sympathizers, Islamists, far leftists, far rightists, and so forth. After each attack by Hamas on Israel, the narrative about culpability invariably shifts quickly from Hamas to Israel, because Israel is responding, and this is to Hamas's benefit. Perversely, the more misery endured by Gazans, the more convincingly God, Hamas can accuse Israel of aggression and the wider and more vehement its support. As a result, in the words of President Joe Biden, a significant portion of Palestinian people do not share the views of Hamas, unquote. Part two, and this is the first of three parts, looking at the Gazan views of Hamas, amplifying on this statement by Biden. In the first place, there's polling. 
there is a vast trove of evidence from polls from pre-October 7th that indicates that Gazans understand the Hamas strategy and reject the role as serving of pawns in obsessive and illusory jihad. Here's a poll from the Washington Institute on Near East Policy from July 2023, just two months, three months before the uh, massacre. I, there are many, many parts. I'll give you a few. 40% of Gazans view Hamas negatively. 42% agree with the statement, I hope someday we can become friends with Israelis since, since we are all human beings after all. 44% agree that we should recognize that we will never defeat Israel and that fighting just makes things worse. 50% agree that Hamas should stop calling for the destruction of Israel and instead accept a permanent two-state solution based on the 1967 borders. 59% support the Palestinian resumption of negotiations with Israel, and 63% want direct personal contacts and dialogue with Israelis. Confirming this, even closer to the October 7th date, finishing literally the day before, something called the Arab Barometer surveyed Gazans, and it found that rather than support Hamas, the vast majority of Gazans, the vast majority of Gazans, have been frustrated with the armed groups and effective governments as they endure extreme economic hardship. Most Gazans do not align themselves with Hamas's ideology. Unlike Hamas, whose goal is to destroy the Israeli state, the majority of survey respondents favored a two-state solution with an independent Palestine and Israel existing side by side. So here's part one. Polling shows the Gazans are not happy about what Hamas is doing to them. The second part of the proof are demonstrations. Now, while polling in Gaza's brutal environment may be vulnerable to manipulation, there are other manifestations of anti-Hamas sentiment that confirm this, especially as Hamas has retreated from northern Gaza. For example, a live televised scene, a passerby disrupted a speech by a Hamas spokesman, brandishing his bandaged hand in the air and shouting, May God hold you to account, Hamas. This much-shared clip led to Hamas issuing a public threat. Quote, we warn against publishing any pictures, videos, or materials that are offensive to the image of the steadfastness and unity of our people in Gaza, unquote. A video of hundreds of Gazans evacuated to the south shouting, down with Hamas, is available for view. Outside of a hospital in southern Gaza, Northern Gazans demand that Hamas release, release the Israeli hostages and the fighting and make it possible for them to return home. In this second uh, demonstration, children held white pieces of paper saying yes to giving back the hostages. Protesters. Break up. No problem? No, no, continue. Sorry. Uh, protests were shouted out at these demonstrations. We want to end the war. We put our trust in Allah. We don't want food coupons. We want to live. We want to go home. Now, looking at these various demonstrations, the head of Kogat, the Israeli Defense Forces liaison with the Palestinians, noted that more and more evidence of public criticism voiced by the residents of Gaza against Hamas has been evident. To prevent further protests, one media reports notes Hamas has deployed security personnel to refugee centers, schools, and other locations. So first polling, then demonstrations, and finally the interviews. Uh, perhaps the most interesting of these interviews are interviews on Al Jazeera or other Arab uh, language channels that go inadvertently awry as the interviewee is supposed to support Hamas and then doesn't and then it gets cut off by the interviewer who doesn't like what he's hearing. So an elderly wounded man was interviewed by Hamas, and he said that Hamas members come and hide among the people. Why are they hiding among the people? They can go to hell and hide there. The journalist cut him off. The young girl was asked about the situation, maybe eight years old. Hamas is putting the people of Gaza in danger. Its fighters are hiding in the tunnels, while Gazan civilians are the victims. An elderly woman, Khan Yunus, was asked about aid. 
She said, all of it goes to the tunnels underground. It does not reach the people. Hamas takes everything to their homes. She concluded with defiance. They can take me, shoot me, or do whatever they want with me. A man on the street interview ended with, may Allah send, settle the score with Qatar and Turkey, at which point the interviewer cut him off. Also interesting is that Gazans are now speaking to foreign reporters, often allowing themselves to be identified. Here are a couple of examples. A 56-year-old businessman said, people are dying at every moment. Hamas is the one that dragged us into this terrible vortex. A hairdresser from the north, now sheltering in the south. Damn Hamas. May God be my witness. If I see Ismail Haniya, one of the leaders, I will hit him with my slippers. So there you have some of the evidence to suggest that the Gazans, not happy with Hamas, want to change. Now, my fifth part is to look at what the Israeli government is saying and doing. Now, formally speaking, the government of Israel is silent about the day after. Uh, UN Ambassador Gilad Erdan justified this stance on the grounds that, quote, we're not thinking now about what will happen the day after the war. We need to win this war, and that's the only thing we're focused on. Unquote. But despite this formal silence, the government has dropped many hints. For example, Prime Minister Netanyahu has said that Israel, for an indefinite period, will have the overall security responsibility in Gaza. And then he said, what we have to see is Gaza demilitarized, de-radicalized, and rebuilt. We don't seek to conquer Gaza. We don't seek to occupy. We don't seek to, gov we don't seek to govern Gaza. Key point. We don't seek to govern Gaza. He later further expanded on this. Gaza will be demilitarized. The IDF will continue to maintain security control in the Gaza Strip to prevent terrorism. Defense Minister Yoav Gallant announced the creation of a new security regime in the Gaza Strip, the removal of Israel's responsibility for day-to-day -day life there, and the creation of a new security reality. He also spoke of a Palestinian government that is not hostile to Israel. There will be local committees that are not hostile to Israel, and they will not be able to act against it. In a leak from a closed meeting, he further elaborate, elaborated that Gazans who do not have ties to Hamas will handle civilian affairs. So a picture is emerging that Israel will be on top, overseeing, but Gaza themselves will be administering the Gaza area. My sixth point is that there's support for this. Uh, polling shows in Gaza that the Gaza themselves want this. As Joseph Browdy of the Center for Peace Communications argues, a substantial majority of Gazans oppose Hamas's brand of resistance, that is, starting wars they can't win while hiding in bunkers and leaving civilians to suffer the consequences. Further, a large number of Gazans, while opposed to Israel, adopt a pragmatic outlook on cooperation if it delivers tangible benefit to them. These pragmatists, combined with a minority who believe in coexistence as a principle, constitute a solid base of support for any post-Hamas administration. Together, they show that a different, brighter, and more peaceful future is possible. A decent Gaza, what I call decent Gaza, where Gazans are running the show under Israeli auspices, find support from Western and Arab governments. U.S. Secretary of State Blinken endorsed something along these lines. Quote, we can't have a reversion to the status quo with Hamas running Gaza. We also can't have Israel running or controlling Gaza. In between those are a variety of possible permutations that we're looking at very closely now. He added that Israel must be a partner of these Palestinian leaders who are willing to lead their people and living side by side in peace with Israel. The UK Foreign Secretary James Cleverly agreed, as soon as practicable, a move towards a peace-loving Palestinian leadership is the most desired outcome in Gaza. Arab leaders, one report indicates, support a post-war Gaza ruled by neither Abbas nor Hamas. They hope that economic lures will affect this end. One dollar will not flow as long as you control the Gaza Strip, the leadership of Hamas was told. And Abbas, Mahmoud Abbas, has been told to stay away. In conclusion, upon seizing control of Gaza, Israel can reasonably expect to find plenty of Gazans 
ready to work with it to establish a new authority that returns them to a normal life. They will administer, police, teach, communicate, provide municipal services. While this might sound impossibly remote today, it bears recalling that Gaza was not always what it is today. Before 1987, Gazans led normal lives under Israeli rule. Gaza and the West Bank in the 1970s, recounts historian Ephraim Tosh, quote, constituted the fourth fastest growing economy in the world, ahead of such wonders as Singapore, Hong Kong, and Korea. And it's substantially ahead of Israel itself, unquote. Medicine, electricity, schools, literacy, all flourish. Gazans benefited from refrigerators, clean running water, and much else. As Gazans became violent, Israel failed to cultivate friendly relations with Gazans who were not violent, who were willing to live side by side with Israel. As a result, Israel lacked decent Gazan partners, and in an act of historic stupidity, handed the government first to the genocide of Yasser Arafat, and then to the even more horrific Hamas. For public relations purposes, I suggest calling this entity the new Palestinian Authority, although it had nothing to do with the existing Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. In fact, I envision a tough Israeli military rule overseeing a tough police state along the lines of what one sees in Egypt and Jordan, a place where one can live a normal life so long as one stays away from politics, stays out of trouble, and never, never criticizes the ruler, in this case, the government of Israel. Israel can become a decent place, economically viable, and a relative success story. But it requires the Israelis to take the right steps. So one of the reasons, uh, uh, Dr. Pipes, uh, uh, um, thank you for, your, for the, the presentation, one of the reasons that I, that I think there is much more optimism than than I, I think than you actually uh, uh, um, than you actually see or, or or are aware of. I think this is the direction that Israel is going. Um, we at the JCPA, together with uh, uh, with partners in the Bitcoin team as well, came up with a similar plan, which which really does talk about those same principles: the idea of Israeli overriding security, uh, uh, um, really control underneath that a guiding force of international players that will play a part in the rehabilitation of Gaza, whether it be infrastructure or whether it be the economy, and at the same time, local areas being run by Gazans, by the heads of clans or whoever it may be in those different areas. And, and we believe that this is a workable plan. We're discussing this also with uh, uh, with, with other partners in the area, not just in the Israeli government, but also from the other side. And and I think that there is much more uh, um, optimism about that type of an idea than, than I think you even realize. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm not hearing it. Uh, what I'm hearing are terrible plans about bringing in the PA or bringing in the Saudis or having Israeli control or having pushing out the Gazans and having Israelis move in. So I'm not hearing this, but if it's taking place, that's wonderful. It is, Daniel. I, th I think that there are a couple of um, observations here. Number one, the reason you're not hearing it is that people simply don't know. And I think that uh, in this uh, very complex, um, uh, undetermined, violent, uh, unstable Middle East, there's, there's very little that we really know about the day after uh, in Gaza. Uh, I think many people are making assumptions about local clans, even those that we in the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, together with our partners in the uh, Israel Defense and Security Forum, otherwise known as the Bitcoinistim, have written and actually uh, presented to the highest levels of the Israeli government. Uh, we, we, we simply don't know uh, what the reaction of the local, uh, of, of local Gazans in their readiness to take a leadership position, as you very eloquently suggest that they may, according to um, some polling. We, we've seen other polling that show at least 50% are still supporting the Hamas out of fear. This is a an Iranian, uh, essentially, proxy uh, area. It's become an, a forward base for the IRGC. There are IRGC operatives on the ground uh, in Gaza. There have been for the last 15 years. Um, so one of the reasons that, that you haven't heard anything from the Israeli government is that the Israeli government 
Simply, they just don't know. Just don't know. They don't know. And both Maurice and yeah, I finalized and Cooper and others here who are uh, uh, colleagues and, and dear friends of your of yours would would testify uh, to the fact that people simply don't know because there are so many variables uh, that are still unknown uh, in this uh, evolving uh, or I should say devolving um, um, war opposite the Iranian regime in the south, in the north opposite the Houthis, the Iraqi special forces, Syria. And, and so we just, we simply don't know what what the day after Hamas, if there's a day after Hamas might look like. Final point is that, you know, where you are now, or certainly a few miles uh, to to the uh, to the West in, in, in DC, the calls and the pressures as we understand the JCPA for what they call a two-state solution are overwhelming and very well may cause a reconstitution of the Israeli of the Israeli uh, coalition, and it may it may be that there is an extended pause in the fighting, which further distances us from what we're talking about this afternoon in your eloquent presentation of the day after Hamas. Right, of course, there are many pressures from the outside and also from the inside uh, due to the hostage situation. Yes, acknowledge. I just thought I would go beyond those, but yeah, they're very real. I think that some of the fear, Dan and, and, and Dr. Pipes, is that even for the local Gazans, expressing their true opinion as to as regards Hamas and 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 really the day after is something which they generally fear, and they and and they have good reason to fear. If they don't see Israel finishing the work with Hamas and destroying Hamas, then these people are going to have to go back and live under a reconstituted Hamas, a reinforced Hamas, even now during the war. When Israel was opening the humanitarian uh, uh, corridor from the north to the south, Hamas was killing the Gazans, not only using them as, as, as Dr. Pipe said, as, as cannon fodder, but literally killing them to stop them moving south and moving out of the way. Even now, some of those who have been criticizing Hamas have been executed. And so they're, they're, they're really creating that fear, that same terror yeah, in the hearts of the Gazans themselves. And, and, and I think they're lacking for whatever reason, in confidence in Israel to actually finish the job that it set out to do. And I think that's going to play a, a major part in, in in where we go on the day after. I think I'd like uh, uh, Daniel to Dr. Pipes to talk about something that he did not address, which I would call the Pipes Doctrine, which is called the victory, which is called really victory. And I, I must say, before the Gaza uh, counter-terror operation warfare and so on, I was more suspect about the notion of victory uh, as the Pipes Doctrine, as I'm calling it, had called for. And I am less suspect, uh, not suspect, but but less uh, skeptical. skeptical about it now, because what's become clear in our many conversations, and, and uh, we haven't had the pleasure of chatting with you offline, but, but we at JCPA have developed relations uh, relationships with, with very many Arab and Muslim majority uh, actors, uh, both uh, above the radar and below the radar. And what everyone is telling us is that Israel must prosecute um, a war that, that ends in overwhelming victory uh, for Israel in order to make, Daniel, what you suggested possible. And it is possible, but the precondition is an overwhelming victory, both a perceptual victory, a physical victory on the Gaza battlefield in order to make what you just presented a, a, a viable uh, possibility. Well, thank you, Dan. Yes, I've been arguing for close to a quarter of a century, ever since the Oslo process went terribly awry, that uh, you cannot finesse the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. You cannot find some clever solution to it. You can't redirect Palestinian attention to Jordan. You can't find some way of dividing up the Temple Mount. None of this will work. Wars end when one side gives up. Uh, you can think of this on the literal battlefield. You can think about it in the larger strategic sense. Wars end when one side gives up. Now, interestingly, and almost unnoticed, the Arab states did give up. Think about it. From the origins of Zionism in the 1880s until 1948, it was essentially a, what we'll now call a Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And then the Arab states got involved in 1948 in a big way. And they remained in, involved for exactly a quarter of a century until 1973. This was fighting Arab states. And then the Arab states gave up. They gave up. They pulled out. 
with this only a couple of slight exceptions, there has been no actual warfare between the Arab states and Israel in over 50 years. The Arab states gave up. They pulled out. They talk, but they don't do anything. Serious. In contrast, the Palestinians move back in, and they show a determination and a tenacity that the Arab states did not have. They also have the appeal of being smaller than Israel. The Arab states presented themselves, I remember vividly in 1967, they vividly, they, they urgently presented themselves as the victims. It was pretty hard to maintain when you look at the map that the Arab states were the victims. The Palestinians can much more convincingly make that case, and they do so with great success. So only when the Palestinians have a sense of defeat will they give up their genocidal war against Israel. That has not happened. It is not happening. At the same time, what is happening is a version of the statistics and illustrations I gave you, that there are plenty of Palestinians who want out. They're more interestingly in Gaza than the West Bank because Gaza has gone through a more harrowing experience than the West Bank, but they exist in both places. And I see them as extremely important, as well as Israeli Arab citizens who are also accepting Israel and others around the Muslim world who accept Israel. These are growing in importance. So in a cosmic way, what you see is the Muslims are now more um, fractured, while the left has become almost universally hostile to Israel. Left which did not oppose Israel in the old days is now almost entirely opposed to Israel. And the Muslims are more fractured, and there lies the opportunity to, to bring about a conceptual defeat sense of defeat among the Palestinians. So so I think so I think that that maybe there's a difference between the Arab armies and the and the Arab countries giving up their military fight against uh, um uh, against Israel but really they they turned it all into a political fight. 2 years after uh, um, 1973 we were suddenly seeing the the the, the Zionism is racism racism revolution uh, um resolution in 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 the in the UN and everything then really turning towards that political warfare, the Arab boycott, the Arab uh, Im oil embargo, really using their, 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 their financial and economical weapons in a more effective way rather than their tanks, which had proved to be uh, um, somewhat ineffective. And there you're seeing really that, that whole change moving along. And, and, and so maybe the first signs of really that break in uh, um, the Arab desire um, to destroy Israel was was the Abraham Accords. That's the volatility, as a as a, a um, as as one of our uh, viewers, uh, uh, Lise Corson says, that the volatility of the Arab loyalties uh, um, really has changed and has given them to more an idea of well, what's more in their interests rather than what's only in the in the in, in the Palestinians' interests and allowing the Palestinians really to hold the rest of the Arab world hostage to their ideology and their hostility. That's, I think, that's something which is which is changing more. So maybe that's part of that, that, that really uh, 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 huge change that, that, that we're seeing. Well, I th would argue that the Arab states went from being the primary actors in 1948 to 73 to auxiliaries to the Palestinians. Yes. They no longer have their own cause. They are just there in support. They don't actually do much except support Palestinians, which doesn't amount to a whole lot. And in fact, they are not so supportive anymore. If you look around the world today, who's supporting Hamas? Is it Egypt and Jordan? No. It's more... The Iranians. The, the Iranians, the Turks, and the left. Yeah. Uh, the Chilean government, the Chicago Council, uh, Municipal Council, and so forth. It's the left. Left is enthusiastic, not the Arab states. They want out. They paid a heavy price. They don't want any more of this. That's and, a, yeah, when I said, Dan, you, we might remember, uh, you know, those of us students of history, uh, how uh, Henry Kissinger, blessed memory, W was very much involved in shuttle diplomacy, reflecting the great suspicions that the Arab states even had after the 73 war towards the Soviet-sponsored PLO because the Soviets had made a shift 
away from Egypt and Syria and, uh, and uh, Arab client states to the Palestinian issue, understanding that the Palestinian issue was going to drive the third world powers, the non-aligned powers in the UN against Israel. And in fact, the Abraham Accords was in a sense the climax of, of deeper and deeper Arab state concerns that the Palestinian issue was too revolutionary and was actually destabilizing um, a central uh, um, Sunni state interest across the Middle East. So it, it seems that that, that, that was a, a sea change uh, in 2020 in which, in a, in a sense, the Arab states were truly more aligned with Israel, which they had wanted to be for, for some years and were unable to be. I agree. The, the Abraham Accords were a great development, but I don't think they have a lot of impact on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Those who want Israel to disappear are in no way affect, are no way influenced by the fact that the UAE and other countries have recognized Israel and have good relations with Israel. We couldn't care less about that. So yes, very important on the state level. The state level is not where the action is. That's not what the, the left is not supporting Egypt yeah. or Jordan, or for that matter, Turkey. Yeah. It is supporting the Gazans and the West Bankers, and to a lesser extent, the non-citizens of Jerusalem. That's who they're concerned with. That's the focus. I mean, look at what just happened with the President of the United States invoking his powers against four individuals in the West Bank. Who's ever heard of such a thing? It's this focus on the West Bank and Gaza that's so extraordinary, unique. And this is Israel's problem. I think Israel's greatest problem is not the violence, though that is clearly a problem too. It is the narrative, the Palestinian mm -hmm. narrative, which is growing in appeal. And even liberals, uh, moderate liberals like Joe Biden, have to pay uh, homage to it. It has a power. And so the only way to deal with that narrative is not by going around the world and trying to snuff it out everywhere. It's too big a task. Can't be done. The only way to deal with it is by convincing the Palestinians themselves to end their conflict. Well, you have to go to the root. Can't go to the leaves. There are too many leaves. You have to go to the root. And the root is the West Bank and Gaza. And now Israel has a chance in Gaza to end the hostility, the fervent hostility. Yeah, hostility can still be there. But like the hostility in Egypt and Jordan, it really doesn't matter that much. It's tamed. Uh, the Palestinians need them likewise to be tamed. And now the opportunity is there. A horrific premise, but something good can come out of it. Do you think, Dr. Vibes, that, that, that the American administration has the best interest of the Palestinians at heart? Um, I ask that question because their, their, their idea, their, their fallback position is that the Palestinian Authority immediately be put in charge the Palestinian Authority has not been good for the Palestinians. Um, it's brought hatred and uh, and corruption really into the heart of Palestinian society. There hasn't been a working uh, uh, court system ever established there. And yet that appeared to have been the immediate fallback position of uh, uh, the Biden administration. Now they're going down this uh, uh, road of, of accepting a narrative which really doesn't support anything that the Palestinians will be able to rule themselves. Um, it, 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 it's almost like saying, well, if, when we pull out of, of, of Afghanistan, so everything will be okay. The Palestinians haven't yet proven or shown or even been allowed to develop any type of governance system. The Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas Fatah, haven't allowed them to do that because of the corruption. And yet the Biden administration seems to be pushing in that direction in any case, why do you think that that would be the case? Because it definitely is not in the Palestinians' best interest. I think the, the brief way of answering is to say that wherever you see the term pro-Palestinian, like a pro-Palestinian protest, substitute pro-Palestinian with anti-Israel. It's not that they're pro-Palestinian, it's they're anti-Israel. So Biden is being influenced, he himself is not anti-Israel, but he's being influenced by substantial anti-Israel elements in his own party as he seeks re-election, and he is placating them by taking steps that are anti-Israel. No, they're not in the least pro-Palestinian, they're anti-Israel. If you're pro-Palestinian, you're concerned about the welfare of Palestinians, not the harm of Israel.
Yes, uh, uh, clearly. I mean, one of this is uh, one of the great challenges that we've uh, taken head on. I know you've been also uh, dealing with this. The Palestinian Authority, in the view of the Israeli consensus, and I think there's, I think there are polling numbers to show that people understand the Palestinian Authority in its uh, constant, ongoing, thirty-one year campaign incentivization to terror, incitement to murder Jews and Israelis, uh, the international um, political warfare that has been prosecuted against Israel makes essentially the the October 7th was the climax of a 30, 30 year uh, campaign that was prosecuted by the Palestinian Authority. They were as responsible uh, as the Hamas for the uh, for the current uh, situation and therefore they are the problem and not the solution that is known as a, across the Israeli political uh, 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 political uh, uh, spectrum uh, and um, uh, body politic and this is this is a huge gap Daniel that we find across the Atlantic with the Americans and the Europeans simply don't understand or accept that fact right uh, I Concur. I would make one distinction, which is I the fact that I pointed to Hamas being perverse in wanting the destruction of its own people. Uh, you don't see that in the Palestinian Authority, the PA, and you don't see that in Hezbollah. They are more normal jihadi movements that seek to win on the battlefield. They play games. They have understandings. They cooperate here and they fight there. They're far more complex entities than Hamas, which is seeking its own people's destruction. PA hasn't done that. Hamas, uh, sorry, Hezbollah hasn't done that. Indeed, after the 2006 war with Israel, the leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, said had he known that capturing and killing a few Israelis would lead to this widespread destruction, he wouldn't have done it. That's more normal. Hamas is the perverse one. So yes, I agree it's October 7th is the culmination, but it takes a different form. Uh, PA wouldn't do that. It doesn't want to risk its own well-being for political purposes, for getting support around the world. It is a different animal, a more predictable animal mm. than Hamas. I, I, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that I, I, I would agree with that. And uh, just, just look at what Hezbollah is doing at the moment, uh, Dr. Pipes. They've gone into a war. They fired, as I said in the introduction, over 2,000 rockets and anti-tank missiles at Israel. They're in a war that isn't their war. They're being directed by by Iran to get into this fight. And and really, slowly but surely, and, and really surely, we're going downhill. And, and really, the destruction in Lebanon is, I think, going to be quite, is already and will be much more extensive. That's not that's not pragmatism. That's that's dogmatic J Israel hatred directed by uh, the Iranians. And and well, even if Hezbollah were to seek this maybe middle ground of, of, of politics, that they're, they're, they're just not there or not capable of making well, that decision. I didn't use the word pragmatism. I didn't say they're not ideological. I'm making a distinction between Hamas, which wants positively wants death and destruction. And Hezbollah and Palestinian Authority, which endure it as a necessary result of their hostilities, but don't 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 want it. They act in a they have a calculus which is much more familiar. They're playing games. The current situation on the northern border of Israel is a game. They shoot, Israel shoots, it's normal. That's what enemies do. You don't have, Hamas is not normal. It, it engaged in hostilities, such as October 7th and many prior occasions, where it wants to be battered, it wants to be smashed. I would argue to you the PA and Hezbollah do not want to be smashed. They want to prevail on the battlefield. And if they do get into a larger fight with Israel than is the case, well, maybe it's on directions from Iran. Maybe they feel they can do well in these circumstances with Israeli security forces being so stretched. I'm arguing that they are following a more usual logic than Hamas. Actually, Daniel, I think it's a very important point you're making here. If you, it, it takes us into a discussion. I wish we had a lot more time for it. But remember, uh, it, one of the founders of Hamas was also uh, Osama bin Laden's uh, a mentor. 
uh, Abd al Azam, uh, the uh, Janine cleric, who became uh, one of the most important, um, if not theological, but political leaders of Al Qaeda before Al Qaeda became Al Qaeda. And what I think what Dr. Pipes may be referring to, which I hadn't thought about before, is, well, not, not recently anyway, is the penetration of Salafi jihadi uh, uh, ideology inside Gaza for many years. Uh, and, and that there is a suicidal, um, you know, a, a sadomasochistic element in the Salafi, uh, in Salafi ideology, which results in the execution by Hamas of its own people, in the mass humiliation, if you see today on Twitter, marching hundreds of Gazans around and executing them for asking for humanitarian aid. So there is this notion that Hamas is wanting to draw fire, killing its own people. You don't see that with Hezbollah. You don't see that with the what, what the Daniel's calling the more normative jihadi operations. It's very interesting to think about the, the, um, the self-immolation uh, um, tendency within Hamas because of many years of, of this Salafi penetration in the Gaza Strip. Right. The only dis difference I'd, I'd make is that it's not masochistic. It has a political purpose. You get battered, you or you, you subject your people. I mean, you're living in a five star hotel somewhere. You subject your subject people to getting battered, murdered, killed, destroyed, hungry, and so forth. And the outside world, especially the left, responds by supporting you. Mm. In other words, it's it's a, an yeah. oblique way of getting support. It's not that they want to be battered in itself. They want to be battered so that the outside world will come to their support. PA and Hezbollah don't do that. They mm. fight in a, in a more normal, normative way. I think that's the common denominator between the, the, these organizations, though, between Hamas, the PA, and Hezbollah. I don't think that any of them really have any basic fundamental respect for the lives of the Palestinians. They're all willing to use them as simply as pawns. I think Hamas is happy to see dead Palestinians because, because as, uh, 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 as Dr. Pipe said, it, 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 it looks good on television. It's good for the left and it's good for the international community to see dead uh, uh, Palestinians, and that brings a price. But the, the, the Hamas itself as an organization, their leadership, they, that, they don't want to die. They weren't sending their own children, as, 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 uh, 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 as we all know, they weren't sending their own, own children to carry out suicide bombings. They were sending someone else's children because they're happy for someone else to die for their cause. They want to live on another day to kill more people. Daniel, what do you, uh, in your final thoughts, give us uh, some pre prescriptive thinking about how Israel, uh, I, we spent uh, the other the other night with several uh, former U.S. Uh, uh, Deputy Secretaries of State um, in a previous administration. And, and we were asking them as well, as, what does Israel do now? Because it's in a real pickle in terms of its policy uh, and its, um, its, its wartime reality opposite the Hamas. The Israeli body politic knows and is prepared for and is completely motivated to win. Uh, to defeat the Hamas militarily, to defeat it politically, to wipe it off the face of the earth. It, I think it's the first time since 1948, that maybe 73 perhaps, but it's a different context, that you really have a full consensus in Israel of, that people are willing to sacrifice until victory. Um, but there are many political obstacles to such. We're, we're, we're seeing it and feeling it. And the question is, how do you, what prescription would you offer Israel opposite uh, you know, the Biden administration, um, um, the, the France, Germany and Britain all lined up with the Biden administration. They're demanding that Israel stop the war now. Th this is um, information that we're getting firsthand from Washington. They want a hostage deal. They want to deal with the Iranian regime. Uh, this looks like Obama 2.0. And, and it, this is real. This is information that we're getting from Washington. I would say that there are times when a government, a state, must do what it must do. And uh, Israel's relations with the Western powers that you just alluded to uh, have always been tempestuous. They've always had their ups and downs. Uh, I think we're headed towards a down. And there'll be a lot of disapproval. 
There might be withholding of some armaments, some other benefits. Yeah, those will be there. Uh, it will not always be there. Things will return. There's a wheel that keeps turning. Uh, Israel should do what it needs to do, which is two things. Take control of all of Gaza and destroy Hamas and replace it with something decent. These are the key goals that must be kept in mind. Everything else is ancillary, including, I might add, the hostages. They're ancillary. They are not the point of this. Uh, be careful, I would advise the Israeli government, to stick to the things that are essential. Don't provoke. Don't do things which are unnecessary or unnecessarily provocative. Do what you must do. End this situation. Come out to a brighter day in the future. A brighter day for Gaza and a brighter day for Israel. That really is one of the most difficult things I think that we're, we're facing at the moment. How to, on the one hand, um, defeat Hamas and uh, de really destroy Hamas entirely. But on the other hand, try and bring about the release of the hostages, which any type of deal um, on, on, on that subject will, will really embolden Hamas and will give them that hope to to survive for another day. And, and the Biden administration obviously hoping that any type of temporary pause will continue and develop into an entire cessation of the hostilities and that really Hamas will be allowed to, to survive another day. I think that's a subject which uh, uh, um, really, it, 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 it's almost two contradictory goals, um, as difficult as that, that may be. Um, Dr. Pipes, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for uh, uh, devoting your time to us. Um, we will uh, be back with everyone again tomorrow at four o'clock Israel time. Um, we will, uh, uh, again, the discussions will, 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 I hope, be focused on um, this idea, a very simple idea of, of, of Palestinian uh, uh, governance and the fact that Mahmoud Abbas is now in his 20th year of his first four-year term as a leader of the Palestinian Authority. Yep, you heard that right. 20th year of his first four-year term. Um, so that's going to be a little bit of the discussion I hope that we'll get into uh, um, tomorrow afternoon. So join us again then. You can uh, join either via the, via the Zoom link on our site, jcpa.org, or you can uh, also subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, also on our uh, website. And for those of you who can, um, obviously, uh, we're, we're, we really do ask that you push the, the new button that's on our site. It's a donate button um, that helps our activities continue on and, and to be able to continue on to be bringing you the analysis that we think is so important for everyone to hear and to see and to read, um, to better understand what's going on in the entire region, not only in this conflict uh, with Hamas. Until then, everybody, stay safe. Dr. Pipes, again, thank you for your time and we will 